This is A Confused Heap of Facts, the podcast where we have a discussion about history with the faculty of the Department of Military History in the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College. The views expressed in this podcast are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the Department of the Army, Department of Defense, or U.S. Government. Dr. Jonathan Abel. I'm here with Dr. Bill Nance. Hello. And we have a very special guest today, Dr. Michael Benura from our DeJamo department. Dr. Benura, welcome. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, so, Dr. Benura, you wear a couple of different hats uh, professionally and academically. So, if, if you could tell us a little bit about your uh, military career and also your academic background before we start. Absolutely. So, I graduated from the U.S. Uh, Military Academy in 1997 as an armor officer. Uh, and I went to Germany for my first tour, uh, com- or uh, led a tank platoon and a mortar platoon. And then I went to Korea and commanded a divisional cavalry squadron. Uh, so that had tanks uh, and, and infantry fighting vehicles and mortars and maintenance and everything. Uh, and it was a pretty good time. Uh, and then I... Uh, I got the opportunity to teach military history uh, back at the U.S. Military Academy, West Point. Um, So I did that uh, for three years, and in preparation for doing that, uh, I was accepted into the Florida State University's Institute on Napoleon and the French Revolution because I was going to teach uh, the survey military history course or the history of the military art. And we should mention this is under Dr. Donald Horward who is responsible for a good chunk of the Napoleonists in the country now. Absolutely and had a very close relationship with uh, the history department at West Point. Uh, he, He enjoyed teaching future or officers that would teach there mm-hmm. uh, and and that his legacy would continue to educate officers. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I did that uh, and then uh, for a number of reasons timing uh, the timing of my command being one of them I decided to uh, leave the armored branch and become a uh, a nuclear and counterproliferation officer for the Army, and so the Army sent me to uh, graduate school again at the University of New Mexico for a nuclear engineering degree, and what I tell people is uh, even a nuclear engineering degree beats working for a living, right? <laughs> so uh, I had an excellent time there, and then I ended up working across the nuclear enterprise with National Labs, uh, the interagency on some domestic consequence management work, um, but, that, but I will tell uh, the military historians in the crowd that uh, I, had, I had earned my Ph.D. Uh, two-thirds of the way through teaching at West Point. So when I became a nuclear and counterproliferation officer, I, was already a PhD, I already had a Ph.D. So when I went back to do my thesis work at the University of New Mexico, I was expecting that nuclear engineering master's degree thesis and, and uh program to be fundamentally different. And what I found much to my surprise was uh, the process was exactly the same. Obviously, the research was different, uh, and it was was an experimental uh, thesis, so that was different. But the format of the process, you know, the the components, it was all the same. And in fact, uh, mine was the only thesis in the nuclear engineering uh, department that didn't have to get rewritten because I knew how to do a literature review right. uh, and I knew how to phrase an arg- phrase the experiment in an argument, mm-hmm. which they don't really teach engineers how to do. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's kind of my background. Okay, so what we're going to ask you to do today is to, to put on your um, French historian hat and we're going to talk about French influences on the American army, particularly the early American army. Um, so your research is in kind of two different directions. One of them uh, you wrote on a Napoleonic general, Kellerman, and then you also have written on what we're going to talk about, which is the American influences, uh, French influences on the American army. 
Uh, so people familiar with military history might, might be aware, you don't generally cross the Atlantic in that way as a scholar. Um, people tend to kind of work in their, on their side of it. So how did you go from studying Kellermann, Napoleonic cavalry general, to looking at French influences on the American army? So the story begins with, I was, uh, the, the history department at Florida State had a, um, had the Institute on Napoleon and the French Revolution, but it also had a reasonably strong Civil War uh, program and a World War II program. So I, I would interact with graduate students from a variety of American kind of military history topics. And honestly, I can remember almost vividly, uh, I was golfing with one of the Civil War graduate students, and we were, of course, walking between holes talking about military history, because that's what all golfers do. Um, and, and the topic came up, and I asked the question, right, uh, why wasn't the Civil War more Napoleonic? Because all of the greatness of the Napoleonic uh, operational art, you know, the, the core system and, and what the core system allows you to do maneuvering on the battlefield and uh, combining envelopments with penetrations to produce a more decisive effect uh, all of that is, is generally speaking, absent from the Civil War. It has some of these trappings, but not the intellectual backing of them, right? It's almost like uh, they, were, they were aping the form of Napoleonic warfare, but not really the spirit of it. Uh, and so this, this was a question that I kept coming back to, and honestly, it, f it led me to get into the tactics uh, of the... Napoleonic and French Revolutionary era to figure out how these mechanics actually worked because mm -hmm. uh, you can remain at the wave top level and understand Napoleonic warfare uh, but when you get a little bit deeper than that some things don't make sense and you really have to dive in and figure out how these things materialize on the battlefield. Um, this combined with uh, and this is another uh, pitch to uh, military historians that are interested in getting a PhD you should ensure that the topic you are studying is supported by archives you have access to. <laughs> and so knowing that I would be at West Point for three years, uh, I arranged a dissertation topic that I would be able to research primarily at the Special Collections at West Point. Um, and it was a, a transformational experience living at your archive mm -hmm. because I would go uh, for one or two hours every single day um, after teaching and what that allowed me to do was read things, think about them, um, my research drives in a different direction, I go back to those things and look at, at materials in a different way mm -hmm. uh, and normally you just don't have that kind of access to your archival sources. Right. right. Um, or you've taken pictures of some, but not everything, and right. and you can't, right can't chase rabbit holes. That's right. Yeah. So on that, it's kind of interesting because the thirteen colonies to start out are very heavily British. George Washington had a held a commission in the British Army, and so most of the original people that make up the American Army, of course, have British ancestry or and have British military connections. So how is it that it seems very quickly that we shift from a British military tradition to now you are arguing that there's some French influence almost immediately. Well, in there. and to add on to that question, if we talk about the origins of the of the U.S. Army as an institution, there there are two traditions, as Dr. Nance is getting at. There's this European tradition, which of course is is British focused for English speakers, and then there's also this per, perhaps we might call it the frontier or backcountry type fighting that most colonists engage in against First Nations people. The ranging tradition comes out of that. Um, so we've got those two kind of ideas floating around. To, to, to detail Dr. Nance's question a little bit more, um, how, what is the origin of the U.S. Army? So I'll start with a conclusion I reached in my research. And the, one of the conclusions I reached was uh, because the American military tradition was based on amateurs, citizen soldiers, uh, whether, whether officer or enlisted, um, the American, because of the role of literacy in the American experience, uh, 
these American military amateurs read. Mm-hmm. Th- these were not learn on the job sorts of fellows. They understood the value of education. Uh, and so there was a vast and deep uh, trade in military publications. Um, and so for the for the more formalized part of the military tradition, these all right Nathaniel Green, George Washington, these these folks would have all read everything they could get their hands on coming out of Europe. And by and large, most of that was uh, British. British writings, British theorists, British drill manuals. Um, however, there was also interest in uh, the French sources as well. So you get a number of translated French works that enter this kind of intellectual mix. Um, I would say, th- th- this is another thing that I realized, and, and it is one of the things I will eventually get into, but it's a good question, right? There's a, clearly a frontier tradition in, Amer- in the American military experience, uh, and yet it is not the dominant tradition in the American military uh, development. Mm-hmm. Um, and I believe, right, because you don't get a light infantry doctrine specifically or a counterinsurgency doctrine or an irregular warfare doctrine um, throughout the 19th century Mm -hmm. when arguably such a manual or doctrine would have been most valuable Mm -hmm. because the American army is out on the frontier from the revolution, uh, you know, through the end of the frontier. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I believe that there is a petite guerre or a a small wars uh, doctrine within European warfare Mm -hmm. that is uh, very, very tactical, Mm -hmm. and it often gets overlooked in importance. Um, But this is, you know, Mahan, Alfred, uh, or uh, Dennis Hart Mahan writes Outpost, um, and and this is the, there's a longer title, but, (laughs) but it starts with Outpost, and it's essentially this kind of small wars doctrine of, how do you regulate patrols? How do you mm-hmm. um, conduct skirmishes? How, you know, all of these very small wars kind of things. And what the American tradition, what American officers find is that um, everything they need to be successful in this kind of irregular context, there is a European doctrinal heritage that provides enough uh, intellectual stimulus to allow them to go forth. And that kind of led, leads to the next question of what did the early American military do? In other words, what was the kind of the, 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 task the and point? That, yeah, their task and purpose. What was, what was their point? Because is it to fight the First Peoples or is it to fight European nations or is it to do something else? And this is, let's, let's limit this before we get deeper into it to the period before the founding of West Point. So the first couple decades, right. what is the U.S. Army's task and purpose? Well, looking at it from a colonial perspective, um, so the American frontier tradition is one of expansion. And it's not one of governmental or official expansion. It is land speculating, right? So you always have civilian populations expanding out into uh, First Peoples territories and then conflict arising, and then the government gets involved, whether that's uh, British colonial governments or the American government, the state's governments, then they come in and attempt to regulate the interaction. Uh, So in the beginning, uh, the military tradition is, it's not just frontier fighting, Mm -hmm. but it's really uh, homestead survival, right? It's, it's, um, skirmishing with first peoples which is not at all a european they are not european nation states they're not fighting in a nation state uh, capacity they're not wearing uniforms lining up to fire volleys right and they're not they're not even trying to kill each other per se mm-hmm. um because the first peoples versus first people warfare uh, there is definitely an element of uh, capturing. It's agonistic, right? It's just kind of this constant low that's level, right. like the Greeks used to do. And that's exactly. And and first people slavery is very much the Greek type slavery, where uh, you could you could be captured on a battlefield, uh, 
or in a skirmish, you could be taken to another tribe, and then over the course of, of a period of time, you become a full-fledged member of the tribe in full good standing, right? Um, so the settlers bump into these these kind of first people raiding parties, war parties, um, and they generate uh, they generate a mirror image of these tactics. Um, so that's that's out there, but honestly that has very little impact on what will be known as the American military tradition because even the French and Indian, right, everything before the French and Indian War is very localized, not even colonial, right. but it is, you know, portions of the colonial frontier. Mm -hmm. So you could have coastal colonists be completely unaffected by what's happening in... Or the people of... North Massachusetts, now Maine, devastated by the Pequot War, and no one else being affected. That's right, and no one else caring, right? right. And this this generates, in no small part, the coastal inland separation in American politics, at least through the Civil War. Mm -hmm. so, so you're kind of detailing that there's, in military thinking, that there is a frontier approach, which is generally handled at the local level but then there's also it's passed from father to son essentially and, and and then there's an actual what we would call prof, what the europeans would call a professional military tradition which is separate which is kind of separated from the fighting with the first peoples it's connected to it but it's separated from it is that a correct way of looking at it absolutely absolutely and um let's not forget that you know Braddock's defeat on the Monongahela, notwithstanding, uh, European soldiers, units, and, and armies do reasonably well against First Peoples. Um, it's it's not right. The, the Braddock's defeat um, is more the exception that proves the rule, mm -hmm. uh, because and and this is this factors into the American response to frontier warfare as well. The way you beat an irregular frontier first people's enemy is by grinding constant conflict and you mm -hmm. don't allow them to time to rest and recoup especially campaigning over the winter time which is really kind of outside of the frontier warfare uh framework mm -hmm. because those people are hunting and harvesting yeah they they are intimately connected to the survival of the right. the tribe, village, clan, what have you. Um, and this is real. so we like to hearken back to this frontier heritage and right Roberts Rangers is right. kind of Rogers Rangers is uh, kind of the, the hallmark back. But there's very little real uh, institutional connection between the, those periods. So let's talk about the institutional army, right? We can quibble over when it was founded. It's basically founded in, in as a continental army, 1775, disestablished, reestablished later in the 1780s. So in this time between the 1780s and the founding of West Point, the Napoleonic Wars, they're all around the same time. How is the American ar institutional army thinking of itself? Again, task and purpose. What's the institutional army's job in you know eight, 1783 to 1802? So, uh, so after the revolution. So after the revolution and through really the War of 1812, um, there really there's a significant movement to disband the army. So you get very, very little continuity over the period, and the purpose is really. Uh, a small amount of guard duty, um, some uh, rebellion suppression, right? Uh, the Whiskey Rebellion, right? Mm -hmm. Shays Rebellion. Um, but really, these are these are not um, the, the troops by and large that suppress those rebellions are are volunteers and and um, conscripts is not the right word. But they're, they're short-term engagements. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a standing army of any large sort. And so the tradition is really harkens from, um, as far as the senior leaders are concerned, from the revolutionary period through uh, the War of 1812, right? Mm -hmm. But that's a long period, right? That's like 30 years. It's a generation more. more yeah. So, yeah. So the doctrine 
the, the, and it's funny to say a doctrine when you're talking a group of a couple thousand, perhaps. Right. But the but the doctrine and the thinking of the professionals is very much a European, mainly British mindset. But it's almost in theory only because there's barely anybody doing it. Yes, and I would say it's predominantly an officer social, political social construction, right? Because this is how uh, ambitious American gentlemen. Uh, increase their portfolio. Like Alexander Hamilton. Alexander sure. Hamilton. Well, George Washington is a British colonial officer mm-hmm. um, and and very proud to be so, mm-hmm. right? And uses those connections into the British military tradition for social and political purposes. So the bridge in that 1780s to the, 18, the early 18 uh, aughts uh, is very much far more a, a social and political animal than a professional military mm-hmm. institution. Now, just kind of talk about military traditions. There's, of course, the Ameri- the grand old American military tradition of Va- Baron von Steuben coming over and drilling the soldiers at Valley Forge. So we have a British tradition and we have a Prussian tradition. How are those connecting in the early 19th and I century? I would also add, don't forget, there are around 10,000 French NCOs and officers who come over in that same war, too. They do. So, um, by and large, the French keep to themselves, and, right, deliberately so, right, because the last thing French noble officers want their enlisted soldiers to do is to dally in this whole rebellion revolution business. And Rochambeau, too, is very circumspect to, to make the war not look like a French war. Yes, on purpose. Yes, absolutely. Um, So there's not a whole lot of French connection in that direction. And the drill that Steuben is drilling into the American army is fundamentally British drill. Um, So you get this kind of revolutionary period where uh, Washington in particular is hell-bent on creating an American military tradition, Uh, and imbibing all of these uh, tactics and officership and professionalism, and then it gets shut down, and it is essentially um, encased in time and memory, unconnected with the intervening period. Mm -hmm. Because there there are no exercises, there are no uh, attempts at education. Those things cost money. They cost money, and they take people and, and time and... And that you just don't have any right. any real. It's it's hard to focus on large scale European warfare when with you like, don't have scale, right? That's right. So well, so the, one the first of the, graduating class at West Point is two people, and right. that's that's where I want to go with the next question. So West Point is founded during this period. So does that have any influence yet, or is that post War of eighteen twelve Napoleonic Wars that it really becomes an important institution? I would say it, it doesn't have an impact uh, as a professional military institution yet because, again, it is founded primarily as an engineering school mm-hmm. f- and as a way to hedge against the kind of uh, European uh, military aristocracy, mm-hmm. right? So um, Jefferson is very interested in ensuring that the American officer corps as it develops because – you know, there's there's a there are Barbary pirates things, and it becomes clear as the Constitution takes hold that uh, a more localized form of American government isn't going to work. And if you're going to be a real nation state, eventually you're going to need you can't just rely on state militias. That's right. You're going to need a a professional tradition, if not a professional army. So what's interesting is, is what you're, uh, you know two West Pointers in the room is uh, the. Uh, so as Thayer, who is considered really to be the father of the, of the modern academy, as we, or at least the 19th century version of the right. academy, as he's starting to take over, this is post-Napoleonic. Uh, so uh, oh, as, he, as he's kind of coming up there, is there something to that where what he's able to look back onto is, hey, I'm going to go out and see what's out there, and the French kind of have the going tradition? Is there something to that? Well... He will fall in on a burgeoning French, uh, right? So the decision becomes this nascent professional uh, military institution, again, in the early 18-aughts. Which direction is it going to go? 
this is as much a political decision as it is a military decision because the Federalists were Anglophiles mm -hmm. and the Republicans were Francophiles. Mm -hmm. So you get uh, Francophile uh, War Department administrators well before the War of 1812 attempting to force the American army to adopt French drill ma regulations and French manuals and mm -hmm. uh, a more French style uh, of tactics. And the uh, the famous French regulations of 1791 are translated by a French officer for James Madison right around 1810. Yes, absolutely, right? But uh, the War Department can't make it stick because at that point... You send these things out to the state militias and they tell you to get bent because they've had their von Steuben manual for 30 years. And mm -hmm. if it was good enough for George Washington, it's good enough for me. <laughs> right. um, but again, it's the resistance to that is political as, mo as more political than it is kind of a military decision like we like the British regulations more than the French. So let's talk about the, the intervening European and really world events. Um, you, you referenced kind of at the beginning this idea of Napoleon's methods, uh, and and we'll talk about how they get transmitted to America after the wars. But let's let's take a brief second and talk about what exactly is Napoleonic warfare, and how how might it benefit an American army looking for updating its doctrine. So, my argument has always been that there are. There is both a Napoleonic operational art that takes advantage of the developments of a French revolutionary style of warfare. Uh, and this French revolutionary style of warfare from, uh, well, it begins in 1789, but the initial period of the war is purely the um, breaking the uh, noble traditions of the military vice any kind of tactical innovation right, right. so you're uh, you're forming militias you're electing officers then you're you're amalgamating them with existing formations it's really in the early 90s when um, the French revolutionary government is able to kind of begin taking the intellectual workings of the preceding 20 years and realizing them mm -hmm. um, and this is a uh, I identified this as the French combat method, right? And it, uh, it, and it's separate. It is separate from the 18th century style of maneuver warfare. It has a primacy of the offensive. Uh, it understands warfare as a linear construction, but a linear non-contiguous construction. So while there is still battle lines, these things could units could be separated out of sight which would not have been uh, the, the primary method in the earlier period. Um, in the French Revolutionary period, you get combined arms effects to support the infantry attack, right? In the preceding period, light infantry, skirmish with the light infantry, artillery, fight artillery, and then the line infantry fight the line infantry. Now you've got all of these uh, other arms supporting the main infantry attack. Um, you've got, and this is going to be ironic because the drill manuals of the time are hugely prescriptive, but it ushers in a series of non-dogmatic tactics. The quote I love to use for this is a Napoleonic veteran who says that the drill manuals are the grammar out of which the commander constructs his sentences. That is, yes, that is precisely the case, right? It forms... And this is kind of an enlightenment uh, movement as well. It allows a unit, an infantry unit, to act as a full machine. And the officer is the brain of that machine. And they can literally, as the idea comes into the officer's head, the, the organization moves. Let's talk about the officer education for a minute on the continent. So some of this is Darwinian. Uh, staying alive. But uh, how else are we uh, getting these officers who are able to construct these sentences? Is it just survival of the fittest, or is there also uh, officer education going on through the process? Well, so there isn't formal, you don't get real formal officer education until, again, the early aughts. I think the Ecole Militaire is a... So it's founded in 1750 officially. It's disestablished in the 1770s in favor of a set of satellite schools. The problem with those schools is they were exclusive to nobles. Many of them immigrated. So a lot of the Napoleonic commanders, some of them the old nobles, right? Like Grouchy, 
but most of them are people who came up through the ranks simply because they were talented. Right, and that's and so they are educated in the, on the job in these units, so they understand eight, 18th and 18th century drill. Uh, th- those people become these commanders, and they're informed to use the drill in unique and innovative ways. Many of them are former NCOs. Okay. Right. So the question then is, how do they formalize this, or do they formalize this? Because uh, it's great that you have somebody that learned on the job, oh, yeah. but how do you do? How do you make an army out of that? Well, right, like this is the French Revolution, right? The French Revolution literally rewrites time and space. It reconstructs France in departments. It changes the calendar, right? Time and space. They do it again. This is why I think the American tradition really latches onto it. They do it by writing and reading, mm-hmm. right? So the drill regulations of 1791 is kind of the uh, the drill basis. But there is another kind of campaign document in 1792 that lays out all of these components of the French combat method. Uh, and these documents would have been widely distributed and widely read for much the same reason that they were read in the American context, because these former NCOs knew some of the military profession, but they also know what they don't know. Mm-hmm. And so they read these things, they talk about them, they experiment with them on the battlefield, uh, and they begin getting... Uh, they begin achieving successes on the battlefield well outside of their experience. So we've now got the first piece of French land warfare, the tactical piece. Right. What does Napoleon do to take that to the heights he took it to? Ah, so this is the Napoleon operational warfare, right? Like, um, Napoleon is interested in decisive battle because decisive battle is what leads to treaties... Uh, right, not just endless wars, although the Napoleonic period kind of looks that way. Uh, they are punctuated by these treaty uh, or these treaty moments where France gains things uh, on the battlefield. And if you're going to do that, you can't just bang into another army, force them to retreat, and then hit them again. You've got to decisively defeat these things, right? As as much as we like the word decisive. So uh, the Napoleonic battle is focused on the penetration, right? The way to convince your enemy army they are defeated is by taking, maybe not the center, but in the center part of their line. What the French would call a point d'appui, a a key point. A key point, that's right. Uh, And and penetrate their line into the rear area and scatter these enemy formations. And he does that in a variety of ways. One, um, he likes to appear weaker Right, so uh, French the, in the Napoleonic period, French corps and divisions operate on uh, multiple avenues of approach or, or main roads. This not only makes them faster, um, but it also allows them to concentrate on the battlefield. So Napoleon achieves numerical superiority at the point of battle, even when overall his numbers are lower. Um, you've got that penetration. You've got to make to make that penetration work. You envelop the flank, right? You encourage the adversary to deploy their reserves, stretch their line out, and then you shatter it like a hammer. Um, that's Napo- That's the heart of Napoleonic battle. The old Maustrelist campaign, kind of being well, yes, the, right. The best example. The, the piece de resistance, yes, uh, never to be fully replicated again. But that's what, that's what you're really looking for. You don't just want to skirmish endlessly or bang into each other like 18th century armies. You want to decisively defeat these folks. So Napoleon, Napoleon's core system uh, is an established, these are established organizations, not ad hoc. Mm-hmm. They have staffs to disseminate orders rapidly from the commanders. They've got a logistic system to keep them all supplied, even as units are foraging on their own right so there's this blend of the professional and the revolutionary Um, that increases the speed of warfare and operations it increases the decisiveness of them um, and it really this is what leads napoleon to conquer europe now so we've got 
we've got now these wars that are happening, and America's fighting its own war towards the end of this, the War of 1812. That's right. Which is much smaller in comparison. It's important for America, but it's a small battle, small war by comparison to Napoleon's. One of the things I think that's easy to forget is the Americans were not literally watching these wars play out, because they couldn't. There's no TV, right? So it's not until after 1815 that you see these influences really penetrate into America. So let's let's bump forward a little bit. Let's talk about the post-war period, now that we know Napoleon's methods. Let's talk about how they become influential in America in the post-war period. Yeah, so this, and by post-war, this is the War of 1812. And Napoleonic Wars, because they conveniently end at the That's same right, time. they end at the same time. So, uh, and this is where some of my uh, historical training was in uh, the history and philosophy of science, right? This is where my Cunium paradigm moment <laughs> arrives. Uh, and what I, there were efforts from at least 1805, 1806 from Republican administrations to try to get the American army to adopt these French drill regulations. Um, and and they're, they're not successful, right? So it takes Winfield Scott, the towering here, right? The hero uh, of Chippewa, and um, it, it takes him in 1814. He gets injured at Chippewa, right? But it's this, it's this fabulous American victory fought with some of the French elements in it because uh, Scott takes that French drill regulation and drills his American units, and they present like regulars. They fight in this uh, different formation where the artillery and the skirmishers are setting up the infantry uh, success. Now, having said that, Chippewa is a reasonably small battlefield, and and the numbers are relatively small. Like Lacking on, heavy cavalry, too. That's right. There was no cavalry out, and no real envelopment. Um, but that victory propels him to stardom. He gets injured. He gets sent to D.C. in 1814. And in December, he undertakes institutionalizing the French Drew regulations and sells it by force not only of personality but of his uh, of of his renown, and and in very short order, right? In over the the next year year and a half, two years, the French reg regulations are everywhere. The British regulations have been washed out, uh, and he institutes again that French revolutionary construct, and it takes hold in right. We I've begun to think of it, and we talk about in military circles now the theory of victory. Right, the that French combat method with the offensive, linear, non-contiguous, combined arms, non-dogmatic tactics, uniform infantry army. Mm -hmm. So every infantry unit can skirmish, can fight in a line, can operate on outposts in the frontier. You don't get specialized grenadiers and and line infantry. Um, these concepts get embedded in this Winfield Scott period, and again, Winfield Scott dominates. Uh, the American military tradition from 1814 to 1862, mm -hmm. one. So, how does he do that? So we know that say okay, well, we're gonna t we're gonna follow this approach, but what does that actually physically look like to the American army in call it 1820? Uh, how are the, how are they shifting from the British model to the French model? What does it look like to the average private in the American army? Right. Well, so you don't get. You get a far more robust American military establishment after the War of 1812. Unlike the Revolutionary Period, after 18, in 1815, uh, we, we maintain a real army for fighting the country's wars. And in the congressional records, you now begin to hear references to Napoleon and references to the European threat, right? So there is a clear identification that you're going to need more. Winfield Scott, again, he's he's present and in charge, uh, right? He's the not the chief of staff of the army. I think he actually is called the commander of the army uh, for decades. He is able to shepherd this institutionalization in. The drill regulations get to West Point, and it gets in, uh, institutionalized in the education system. Um, you also get... Um, the American translation of the Ecole Militaire um, two-volume history slash warfare slash engineering text mm -hmm. gets institutionalized at West Point. 
Um, so you get the Scott himself in 1815 goes to the continent, right? He he buys a tremendous number of books for the library in 1815. Um, he misses the Waterloo campaign, right? So he doesn't actually see any Napoleonic battlefield, but he's feted because of his reputation, and um, he talks to veterans. He's talking to senior officials. Um, he's doing as much research as he can. Mm -hmm. um, but it gets inculcated both at the, the drill regulation level and the officer education level. So one thing on that note is you highlighted that in the Napoleonic era, it was they read, they understood kind of the basics, and then they how they got good was the Darwinian process of fairly constant combat from really, what, 1792 till 1815. Yes, how does that look in the United States where the regular combat is actually very few and far between? Right. And this is, in, in some ways, this is why they never evolve outside of that French Revolutionary period. They don't have the Napoleonic Wars to inculcate all this operational art business. Um, the, you know, uh, the Mexican-American War is like the next big conflict and by and large, the, the elements of this French combat method provide them with victory in Mexico mm -hmm. um, against, against a Mexican army that is reasonably well-trained uh, and effective. Uh, I mean, it kicked the, the French, got driven out, right, mm -hmm. at Cinco de Mayo. Um, so beating the Mexican army, like, uh, it's confirmation bias, right? They went in with this French com combat method, the first big war, bam, they get all these major victories or what they conceive of as major victories. And they are all convinced that we got it right, mm -hmm. right? After all this time in the wilderness, we got it right in stand-up European-style warfare. We subjugated Mexico. Everything is fine. Um, and this is where, well, I've got, I've got some intellectual conclusions that I reached but well let's let's talk about the the threads that are being woven through this period including through the the Mexican War there's basically three ways the French can influence the American army there's the older engineering tradition and for people unfamiliar uh, the French essentially create modern military engineering in the early uh, late 17th early 18th centuries the Dutch do some of it too but it's mostly French so if you're setting up an engineering curriculum at West Point it's a lot of French including in French there's the kind of first cut Napoleonic drill regulations, operations. And then after that, starting in the, in the 1820s, we have veterans writing and we have people like Germany who are writing theory and military history. So how do those three threads get woven together as the army, the American army is looking for inspiration and practice? So the problem with the American army at this period is they never really they view all of the Napoleonic period through this earlier French period lens, right? They're never able to really see uh, what Germany is, how Germany and, and Napoleonic operational art are different. They just can't see it. And, and another thing worth pointing out, Napoleonic operational art is practiced with armies that are 100,000, 150,000. Also true. Not 20,000. So that, that, that hurts the Americans too. Right, right. It's, it's the lack of experience, right? It also doesn't help the Napoleonic tradition that the French army, which they are still very interested in, has gone in the 1820s into a small professional, uh, it's a small professional force focused on Light infantry tactics and counterinsurgency. Light infantry supported by fast-moving artillery. It's, that's right. That's the, the Algerian method. And so this tradition doesn't resonate with the American audience at all. Mm -hmm. So they miss out on the Napoleonic operational art period to physically experience it, and they don't get any other opportunity. That's why I think they get intellectually locked into this other system, which, again provides victories in the in, in 18 in the 1840s and so they get right you have an idea you have a hypothesis you're pretty sure it's going to work but you don't know and then it works fantastically well let's talk about the geog the geographical and kind of infrastructural differences between 
the Napoleonic era combat, which is generally constrained, really, you could say, between Berlin and Paris. Uh, and for the most part, there's some stuff that goes out to Moscow, obviously. Uh, and then, say, the United States theater. How are those different, and how does that affect how we're looking at the French model and then trying to apply it to ourselves? So, America, and, you know, in the 19th centuries, is vastly larger than the European context, and the infrastructure is much less robust. Um, of course, by the, by the 1860s, there is now rail supporting in the American context, so there are ways to get around this particular problem. But by and large, um, there's far more wilderness in America than there is in Western Europe. So or, it's a long way to Santa Fe. Yeah, yes. Yes, it is. Um, however, and again, this is, you know, graduate student Bonora looking at these uh, conflicts, reading all this Napoleonic history, right? The Napoleonic period has all sorts of lessons to teach American officers in the Civil, Second, yeah, in the Civil War that they're just not picking up on, mm -hmm. right? These are grinding uh, frontal attacks. Uh, they're not subtle at all. And, and in many ways, they have a lot more connection to 19th century warfare, positional warfare, than they do with Napoleonic decisive battle-focused kind of warfare. So you've now brought us full circle, and this is, this is where I hoped we'd end up. So the question that you asked on that golf course all those years ago was basically why, given that all of these Americans had studied Napoleon for decades, why they didn't do it. So we're now at the Civil War. We're now at the point where you would expect the Americans to, you know, break out this Napoleonic stuff and do it. Why don't they? And why are Civil War battles in some ways like 1743, where it's just people killing each other? Yeah, and, and heavily uh, focused on military engineering, especially as the war goes on, right? Like, this is the first trench uh, in trend. The first World War One style entrenchments you see here, yeah, um, yeah it, it definitely harkens back to a to an earlier style. Um, I will actually so, some recent work I did uh, picking uh, Germany back apart because Germany is the great um, th uh, theorizer of Napoleonic battle. Um, the prob one of the problems is Germany doesn't do a very good job of teasing out the Napoleonic differences. And honestly, I've, I've read on war or the art of war five or six times. It wasn't until this last project where I was looking back at um, Henry Lloyd that the Napoleonic differences popped out at me. It, and I'd, I'd been, you know, working in it and working in Napoleonic history for decades. Um, so it doesn't surprise me that American officers didn't get it. Um, and... There are there are things that would make the Napoleonic system difficult to prosecute, uh, the terrain and the 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 distances are so different. Although you could say the the Moscow campaign are the same kind of differences, um, but they don't even try they don't even try to do Napoleonic mm -hmm. war, um, and I think it's because of this French revolutionary tradition. And the overemphasis of, on engineering in the curriculum, right? West Point is producing engineers who fight sometimes. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's very easy to see the engineering and fortification elements of this French revolutionary tradition to be overemphasized in an American context. And what's interesting is, is one of the things you highlighted is, is that Napoleon never really had a school where he taught operational art. Uh, right? he, he did. It was just in his brain. Uh, well, right. yeah, 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 yeah. But, but, but the thing is, like, his marshals either got it or they didn't. Right. Uh, and that is, of course, the challenge that professional military education struggles with from the beginning: is how do you teach this so that someone can come out and do operation, do Napoleon? How right. do you teach genius? Right. Well, ironically enough, the American Army takes a second swipe at Napoleon operational art wise in particular after the second world war and i th this is a a question of they were looking for operational art and then they found napoleon mm 
Uh, but the way they taught, the, the way Napoleon is taught in the post World War II era is fundamentally different than the way it's taught in this kind of in the 19th century. Can you split out those differences? Well, again, the focus, because they've got this revolutionary warfare lens on their eyes, they see these Napoleonic battlefields as nothing more than uh, components of this warfare bouncing along history. And it doesn't hurt that these are, I'm air quoting, democratic tactics as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And funny you bring that up. This earlier framework is a citizen soldier army, which is exactly what the American tradition has. It doesn't, right? American officers don't have that kind of veteran, far more professional army, even though it's made up of conscripts. It is not a democratic uh, or really citizen army the way it is in the 1790s. So you're getting at the, the narrative that the Americans kind of latch on to pre-World War II is the idea that, hey, it's a group of citizen soldiers who are able to kind of put together some good tactics and win on the battlefield, and that's kind of the, they're, the paradigm they're looking at it. Right, and that's all they see. Not all the other stuff. Not all the other... Com it, it's hard to distinguish for them the other parts. Let's also not forget, too, that what we call the operational level of war is not outlined until the 1930s, and it's not current in America until after World War II. So there's, there's that element, too. Well, and this is... So in the 20s and 30s, you have a, a Germany... What is it? A, a Germany... Clausewitz Schlieffen lesson at West Point that considers them a, a, a period of continuity. In in the way it is taught in that pre World War II period mm -hmm. is there is no difference between Germany Clausewitz or Schlieffen, yeah. which would be anathema to the American military of today. But by and large, just like those nineteenth century American officers read Germany and saw French warfare. They read Clausewitz the same way. They weren't interested in the triangle and equilibrium and mm -hmm. higher order stuff Clausewitz was writing about. They're interested in Clausewitz the... Tactician. The tactician. And we forget, because most people don't read all of Clausewitz, most of Clausewitz is tactics. That's right. Now, what'll, what's interesting to me is, is that uh, one of the things that I kind of hit on is, is that if you look at the... 1860s American military uniforms. They're all French. Up to the kepis, the sashes. Uh, the sashes, all that kind of stuff. By the late 1800s, call it, let's just use 1900 for an easy round number, all the uniforms look Prussian. Very much Prussian. So can you talk about this shift from, because we start with British. We do. We become French. And by 1900, we're basically aping the Prussian army. No, and that's exactly how uh, this... Uh, pre-paradigmatic period, Kuhn would say, where you had a strong paradigm through the uh, the 1860s, it gets it begins to crumble or crack under the pressure. In the 1870s, uh, Sheridan goes to uh, has the opportunity to see the Franco-Prussian uh, the Franco-Prussian War. If, if you have an opportunity, those accounts are riveting. His the, oh, the two volume account he wrote about it, and he chooses deliberate. He could have gone. To the French side or the Prussian side, he goes to the Prussians. Mm -hmm. So it is clear to, to the American army that the Prussians are where it's at. But I would say in this period, the American army is responding to these older French ideas. They just see them represented better in the Prussian side than the French side. Again, because of this kind of French veer into this small professional army, the Prussians don't have that. Mm -hmm. They are still very much a uh, citizen soldier army is maybe a stretch, yeah. but they are, their units are made of citizens. Even if their commanders are still aristocrats. That's right. That's right. So um, they're seeing, again, this is all confirmation bias. They're seeing what they believe, their theory of victory exemplified by now the Germans, it's not until, uh, and, and this is kind of my dissertation research endpoint, it's not until 1940 that the American army switches again on a dime um, to, a, to a more German-informed theory of victory. But again, it's a caricature of Blitzkrieg that the American army adopts. It's, it has very little connection with what's really going on the ground. For instance, if you look at Field Service Regulations 1923, 
it's basically French doctrine in Amer- in English. In fact, it, it's, it, it's yes, explicitly so. It, it is absolutely, but again, not current French doctrine for 1923. It's these echoes, it's a modernization of the French stuff the American Army's been doing for a century now. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, George, um, oh, now I can't remember the guy. Um, Oh, I was going to tell the personality story uh, that I wrote out of my app. The, the, he is the chief of infantry. The guy that writes the 1923 regulations is the chief of infantry in 1940, battling for this kind of French style, right? Um, you get a uh, the M1 Garand, the only mm-hmm. gas-operated rifle in the Second World War, designed to produce an increased volley of fire to support an infantry penetration in a frontal assault, right? It, it's, I mean, it's a reasonable rifle. The M1 Grand's great, but it's designed to for a different theory of victory, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and he gets, he's fighting with Marshall, George Lynch. Sorry, sorry. It's uh, General George Lynch is the chief of infantry. He is like the consummate French combat method American general. He doesn't want a specialized. Uh, infantry army. He wants his uniform army, able to do everything, his Swiss army knife, right? He wants a single division. He doesn't want armored divisions and mechanized divisions. He wants tanks in support of infantry. He doesn't want armored spearheads doing crazy things. Um, He's pitching that uh, and he loses to Marshall, who brings this kind of football rationale with him. Marshall is the dominant force in, in the era, he ends up on top. He becomes the uh, the chief of staff um, and is able to essentially... Re- five days after the uh, 100-5 operations comes out in 1940... 100-5? Yes, yes. Yeah. Five days after that publication, which encapsulates a fundamentally different theory of victory... It's got specialization. It's non-contiguous, non-linear, different division formations, right? Offense is as powerful as the defense, right, for the first time in American uh, theory. Uh, Five days later, Lynch retires Mm -hmm. um, because Marshall told him to retire. So why do I bring this up? It takes a personality. In order to spin these theories of victories around, it isn't an institutional thing. It isn't a, we, we the army, gathered enough evidence and convinced ourselves that what we had been doing is wrong. That's not how it's done. You need a personality to make the switch and to sell it, right? When the rifle, an example, when the rifled, uh, when the Minet ball comes out, right, rifled muskets uh, with now you, your range is out significantly longer than smoothbore, Hardy's solution is not to change the tactics, it's to increase the march speed. Mm-hmm. So that you essentially are at risk at the same amount of time you were before, right? It, it completely disregards rifled muskets as a, as a found fundamental change. You've got Sherman in his memoirs saying in the 1890s, future wars will be quick, decisive, you know, short and decisive. Mm-hmm. What in his experience in the Civil War would have led him to believe that modern warfare would be quick or decisive? Right. So we've now covered a huge span of time, a good chunk of the American Army's history. We've talked about how it's kind of seesawed back and forth in its influences. Um, retired Colonel Dr. Mike Benura, instructor of U.S. Army officers. Uh, what should we learn from this kind of case study of, of the French influence on American uh, military thinking? Well, uh, a couple of things. Right. The, the one conclusion I already laid out is that uh, American officers read. They still read. They're still right. We, we have this World War II German prisoner. Oh, the American army was so confusing because they didn't follow their own doctrine. I say hogwash. There is no army on the planet more uh, intellectually dogmatic than the American army. And that's the American army today as much as it was 100, you know, 200 years ago. Um, the American army inculcated FM 24 dash, what's the counterinsurgency? 24 something, right? Petraeus is 3 24. 3 24. Yeah. Um, right? You had lieutenants who had never picked the thing up 
could recite the tenets of it verbatim because that's how we fight. Not to say that we are not innovative. The American army is incredibly innovative, just not intellectually innovative, right? We innovate in the execution of these theories of victory, but not in the theories of victory themselves. We remain committed to ideas far past their obvious objective uh, expiration date. So that was one thing. Uh, the second thing is, um, through probably airland battle in the 1980s, the American army is influenced by Europe and European thought, right? Uh, and my work has been criti criticized by the Murica crowd, which of course we weren't uh, influenced by the French because we're America and we're exceptional. And we are exceptional, but not concerning military thought. Again, until, until airland battle in the 80s, airland battle being, I think, a, a uniquely American uh, intellectual approach to warfare, right? We have this crazy, and again, it's not even, we didn't adopt German tactics or ideas about war. We adopted this idea of what we thought we were seeing, right, what Blitzkrieg was in the Second World War, when at the time Germany was moving well past what we had seen early uh, and propounding more uh, traditionally German kind of ideas about warfare. Um, so those are the two big, oh, and then the third one is the American army needs, and this may be true for other armies as well, but the American army needs a dominant personality to make um, large change happen, right? We are not an incremental change organization. We are a, a we, we turn on a dime, and to make that turn, we need uh, a figure who is powerful enough uh, to f everyone to follow behind. The Winfield Scott. The Winfield Scott, the George Marshall, um, probably, um, yeah, I was thinking William Depew, um, who has an interesting World War II backstory. Uh, yeah, we need those sorts of folks. Um, David Petraeus, right? Mm -hmm. um, General Mattis, right? The, these kind of larger-than-life figures are required for the Army to really turn on a dime. Right, Dr. Bonero, this has been a fascinating discussion. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. If you like this episode, please make sure to check out our other podcast, Broad Gauge Gossips where we talk to members of the Department of Military History faculty so you can get to know them.